This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Roderick Tung. With me, I have a former Northwestern alumni, John Pacini, someone I went to medical school with. John, welcome. Hey, Rod. It's great to be here on Heart Rhythm TV. I think everyone knows Dr. Pacini at Duke University. He's really a specialist in big data and clinical trials. John was going to be part of this in-person AF Summit, and obviously we're now at this third wave of a release for the AFib Summit that was going to cover everything from autonomics, lifestyle, alcohol, innovative novel strategies from ablation to particle therapy. John, you were going to talk more about clinical trials in heart failure, and this is a really important intersection. Tell us a little bit about where we've been and where we should be going. Yeah, so certainly a ton of focus on AFib and heart failure, particularly with catheter ablation, uh, as well as AV node ablation and use of devices. Uh, and it's an area where we've seen a, a massive uh, proliferation of data and where I think we'll continue to see that. Whether it be data from the continued emergence of randomized trials of catheter ablation in patients with AFib and heart failure, uh, or whether it's twists on the varying themes uh, within uh, therapy, such as changing how we pace patients after AV node ablation, whether that's with his bundle pacing or left bundle branch pacing, I think we're going to see a lot of things coming. Um, and it's obvious that this is a topic uh, that really engenders a lot of passion and energy in our field, as you can see on social media and hallway conversations in the hospital. Um, and even hallway conversations and in-person meetings when we have them in Zoom meetings otherwise. And I, I think, you know, one of the things I try to bring out is that there is actually a great wealth of randomized data in this space. And it's true that any one given trial of catheter ablation in patients with AFib and heart failure has some limitations and it has some limitations in size, but they all speak remarkably consistently that there is this potential for improved outcomes. Yeah, and I think, you know, formal meta-analysis, virtual meta-analysis shows it's pretty consistent across the board. And when we're talking about mortality, that's why so many are so passionate about it because catheter ablation isn't something that we traditionally think about as a mortality sparing, you know, modality. This is we what we do a lot is quality of life alleviation of symptomatic SVT, VT, PVCs. So why do you think it is that you've got studies like ATT&CK, you've got CASEL in New England Journal, yet we can't get a class one indication or that's, you know, why is that? Because there's many that were quite astounded and disappointed by that. Yes, and, and I was among them. I think the guideline <laughs> committee would tell you that, well, we don't need a specific class one indication because if a patient has symptomatic atrial fibrillation and many, are, many argue just the presence of heart failure means the AFib is symptomatic, that we have a class one indication for treating mm -hmm. those patients when medical therapy fails. I think the guidelines committee would say, well, the specific recommendation that's 2B is the uh, use of catheter ablation to improve cardiovascular outcomes and mortality where many argue that the clinical trial results are not as consistent. But what I think a useful conversation that often gets left out is what if we flip the script? What's the data for medical therapy? There's a very large meta-analysis of many clinical trials that says that beta blockers don't deliver the same improvements in cardiovascular outcomes in patients with heart failure uh, that have atrial fibrillation. So, you know, we need better therapies for patients with AFib and heart failure, regardless of what the therapies are. And it's really fortunate that the outcomes are so favorable um, with catheter ablation, because we don't always see that with heart failure therapies. Yeah, and I think as we see this emergence of all these non-ischemic cardiomyopathy etiologies with this increasing appreciation of tachymyopathy, you know, I, I love Kistler, Kistler et al. study of camera, you know, MRI, looking at those that have no enhancement, those are the patients that we should not let persist in AF. Absolutely. Not to mention the patients that do have hyperenhancement, uh, that there are some of them who you can resolve the hyperenhancement and figuring out how do we identify those patients uh, so you know, we can deliver them better outcomes, I think is really important. So for all of our viewers, the AF Summit is an unbelievably diverse, amazing program. Please tune in on this third wave Watch Dr. Pacini's talk about clinical trials 
And John, thanks so much for joining us and being part of the AF Summit and Heart Rhythm TV. Thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here. Okay. Be well. See you soon. <laughs>